Now, we will end today with a much awaited panel discussion, which is the final session of our Play Talk Change Conference, involving a very exciting conversation with a spanning group of nine panelists who have joined us from India, Uganda, United Kingdom, and Mexico. The theme for this panel is Gaming for Good. It is going to be moderated by Ishani Kulkarni from Malaysia and Sharon Adan from Uganda, a truly global perspective. I welcome Ishani, who is an Indian communication designer keen on using her skill sets for social impact. Although her specific interest lies in gender and climate justice, she believes that no social issue exists in isolation and co-runs this design, THIS, a design practice focused on social impact through collaborations. As part of Play Talk Change, she led the branding and identity design efforts. The logo you see of Play Talk Change is designed by Shani and contributes to conference planning, copywriting, and social media content. She hopes that Play Talk Change will spark interesting conversations and encourage co-creation between young change makers across the globe. Welcome, Ishani. Our next moderator is Sharon Adong. Sharon is the administrative assistant to the Nanin3 Research Center based in Uganda. She brings significant administrative and logistical management experience to the center. She is a flexible, fun-loving, and extremely energetic person who is a delightful partner to have, who can coordinate different administrative activities involving a variety of projects, especially the ones relating to women and child protection. Welcome, Sharon. Over to you both. Thank you so much, Mehek, for that lovely introduction. So far, the conference has looked at the development and design of Nanintri's own pro-social video games and heard from renowned speakers all over the world about combating gender-based violence. Now, at the close of a very exciting and very educational two days, we bring to you a stimulating discussion across boundaries with panelists from India, Mexico, Uganda, and the UK, hosted by team members located in Malaysia and Uganda. So today in this panel, we aim to broaden those perspectives by diving into the realities and motivations of adopting an innovation approach like video game in combating global issues. So we are hearing from we are hearing stories from people, the game designers, who the people who we call the people who develop the games, and uh, the change makers, the people who deliver these games. So we will invite, we'll start by inviting our first um, panelists to introduce themselves. I'll start with uh, Chaitan from India. Chaitan, could you please introduce yourself? Did you ask me? Yes, Chaitan. I'm sorry. Uh, when I joined, <laughs> half of your statement got cut. I'm sorry. So okay. good evening, everyone. Good evening from India. I'm Chaitanya, and uh, I am a research scholar at IIT Hyderabad. And my field of research is uh, gaming in the field of in the educational field of educational sector of India. We are trying to see whether games can be reconciled with uh, the conventional education that happens in the schools of India, and whether we can use games to replace or at least uh, support use them as support structures in the Indian uh, educational curriculum. I have also worked before this uh, for the archi digital archival of cultural heritage of Telangana, which is a state in India. And uh, I have done my master's in communication from NID before this. And yeah, I think that is the appropriate introduction, introduction for this panel. Yes, thank you very much, Chaitan. So I will welcome the next uh, panelist, and that is Ashish also from India. Ashish, could you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening and good afternoon, good morning from wherever you guys are joining in. 
uh, I am a game developer and a new media designer working in the domain of AR and VR to in multiple in conjunction with multiple uh, domains such as wildlife conservation and uh, educational sector through experiential learning and uh, uh, museum installations uh, to work towards gaming for good. And uh, I have been working in the domain of uh, game development since 2015, uh, so around five or six years, quite early on in my journey. Uh, I hope to learn quite a lot from this panel discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Ashish. That is quite impressive. So uh, let me go to the next um, panelist, and that is Ponima. Ponima joined us earlier, and she's introducing herself for the second time. Hey, everyone. Glad to be part of this panel. I am Purnima. I am a game designer from India. I've been in the industry for about 15 years. I am also a Women in Games ambassador. I teach at uh, NID as a visiting faculty and a few other institutes as well. Uh, I believe games can be made for good, and all forms of games are eventually contributing to something that's better. Uh, I also have uh, started a Women in Games India community, uh, which we are hoping to drive and get more diverse audience into this industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ponima. I'll cross over to Africa now. So I'll welcome the team from Uganda. James Thomas Senfuma, could you kindly introduce yourself? Hello everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sefuma James Thomas uh, from Uganda. I'm a panelist. I'm happy to be part of this uh, platform that is Play Talk Change Conference. We are here for to create a positive change among the youth and children. Yes, uh, by education background, I did my bachelor's in social work and social administration that is from Makeda University. And I also have a Master of Science in Social uh, Research Methods from the University of Dundee, that is in Scotland. Yeah, I've uh, en been engaged in research for quite some good time, over five years. And uh, in the 93 Research Center housed in the Department of Social Work and Social Administration, I'm a social worker, but also a research assistant. And I'm happy to be a part of this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. We are still in Africa and we are still in Uganda introducing our panelists. So um, I'll go to Dennis Agaba. Dennis Agaba. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, I hope everybody's okay. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Dennis Agaba once again. I have a, a, an educational background of theater, but uh, with my 14 years experience in uh, working with young people and children in gaming, uh, where I had to be innovative to start using to young people and uh, the children, uh, especially on issues of behavior change, on quite a number of issues, including uh, uh, gender-based violence, issues of uh, um, you know child protection, and many others. So I have uh, training um, from uh, Norway in uh, uh, using theater and games uh, uh, for children and young people, and I'm also a member of uh, theater directors uh, lab. Of uh, Lincoln Center Theater in the New York City, and uh, I have uh, been working with young people for 14 years. So I have quite a wealth of experience in the community with young people. I'm glad to be here and ready to learn more. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dennis Agaba. I'll cross over to Elisa. Elisa, could you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. 
I really congratulate to the people from People Take Talk Change because it's a great organization uh, of this Congress. Um, not all Congresses get as smoothly as this one. And it's impressive to have all these different panelists. Um, uh, I'm from Mexico uh, City. I have a company on serious games. We've been developed, uh, developing games from the past 10 years in all sorts of different themes. Uh, music, biology, um, critical thinking, uh, spatial thinking, all sorts of different things, especially for NGOs, foundations, and museums. Our last uh, big game was called Chuka, Break the Silence, which was on preventing violence amongst kids, um, physical, emotional, and sexual violence, uh, which is a great issue in our country. And it was a project for education for justice from the United Nations. And it's out there um, to be played uh, for those, uh, as Dennis, um, try, um, dealing directly with kids. Um, it's a tool to break the silence. Um, I would introduce you. I'm happy to be here. Great, I think we can go to the next panelist, Alankrit. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, okay, yeah. Hey, everyone, uh, uh, all audience members and fellow panelists. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alankrit. Uh, you can refer to me as Alan if that's easier. Uh, I'm a game designer from India. I've completed my master's in the UK and for the past three years, I've been working with Indus Geeks Solutions in India, uh, creating learning simulations and training modules across various domains like healthcare, process training, lifestyle and wellness. So it's always been a dream of mine to work in uh, games that are not just for entertainment, but also games that can solve day-to-day -day problems and affect change. So it's been three years since I started this journey and um, it's been super fun. And I'm also looking forward to having a good educational journey today on this panel. That's great. Thank you so much for that. I'll move on to our second panelist named Dennis. Dennis Nono, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Um, Dennis Nono, as already mentioned, is my name. Um, I'm a Ugandan and I'm a medical anthropologist. In my previous experience, I've been working with children, especially those ones with uh, neurodevelopment disorders, where we have used a number of approaches, including um, utilizing all these kind of measures, including games, to reawaken them and to ensure that they are living a positive life. Um, I got my master's from uh, the Medical University of Vienna in partnership with Guru University here in Uganda. Um, I studied uh, global health and uh, medical anthropology. Apparently, I even do work at uh, the African Child Center for the study of the African child that Esther just spoke about um, as a program manager there. And I design a number of programs around children's issues. Um, as well, I am a researcher on uh, children's issues, including social protection issues. And lately, I worked in a refugee settlement conducting a randomized control trial. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. We now go to our last but not the least, our, our very own Craig Gibbs. Uh, hi everyone, thank you. Hey, it's good to be here. I'm Craig. I'm the producer at Nunning3. I'm based in the UK where I lead our very talented team of games developers. Um, we work collaboratively with our partners in Uganda, Jamaica, India and the UK on making these pro-social interventions. Um, I have a background in AR, VR apps primarily. It's, it's been great to move over into pro-social gaming. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and look forward to this. All right, thank you so much for those introductions. Before we begin with the questions, a small note to our audience, please do leave your questions in the chat on YouTube. We will be taking them towards the end of the session. So my first question to our, to our panel is, what comes to mind when we talk of game development or gaming for good? And I think I'll start this question uh, with you, Chaitanya. Uh, 
So great question, first of all. And as we were discussing behind the scenes uh, once before as well, what comes to game, I still don't consider game as something that will revolutionize being good or goodwill. But games, I still consider them as just another tool. It, it can be a hit or a miss. We have had instances where it has turned out to have bad bad effects, like contextually bad, bad effects. But in, in a lot of cases, it has turned out to have some very, very good effects. I remember telling you guys of one case in World of Warcraft where one player, one young player had passed away from terminal cancer and the rest of the players in the whole MMORPG created a shrine for him and they still go there, uh, there they pay their respects. So this is something, uh, this is something not even, uh, like the developers are not trying to ga- uh, extract that from the players, but it comes just from sort of an emergent uh, phenomena that happens uh, with the right ingredients. Uh, other other instances, if you can see, I've, I've read about people who have had lifelong friends who've been playing together, they've never met, and then when they grow old together, they finally meet each other. This, these are the sorts of relationships you you hear in the cases of pen pals. Pen pals, nobody would think that uh, having a pen pal is a bad idea. But imagine games doing this. And so many people testify that, you know, I, I was in the hospital, I had nothing to do, and these were my friends who kept me going. And uh, this was the game that kept me going at that point of time. And gaming is such a vast umbrella that everybody can find their own niche. So everybody can find what they like. Everybody can find their particular type or uh, style of game that suits them. So gaming for good, these are the factors that come without even engineering into it. But I very recently did a survey for my own research and we found out several factors where uh, it, these, these are self-reported uh, surveys where they were able, uh, the people were able to self-report on what they felt uh, was the benefit of games. And they talked about self-learning. They, they were able to gain mental fortitude, emotional fortitude, to try again, to not lose hope, uh, team spirit, interpersonal skills, subject learning. This was mainly about educational games. But subject learning, people were saying, we, we get to learn so much chemistry from Minecraft, from uh, uh, games like Satisfactory, from games like Subnautica. Uh, of course, uh, there are new experiences, strategy and skills. So many people testified that through Age of Empires and Assassin's Creed, we got to learn about history of Italy and history of different tribes. So these are, you know, I can just go on and on uh, for games as a tool for, for good, especially. And yeah, it is always a hit Thank you for that, Chaitanya. I think what you've said has really echoed what Purnima said earlier in her keynote and what Jean Leggett mentioned in her speech yesterday as well. Um, so to have a different perspective on the same question, James, would you like to tell us what comes to your mind when we talk about gaming for good? Okay, uh, thank you, Ishani, for that. Now, when we talk about gaming for good, what comes to my mind because in most cases, when we talk about gaming, we are always talking about the negative consequences of uh, gaming, such as talk about addiction, uh, learning aggressive behaviors, because uh, most of the games that we talk about for children or even adults that play are somehow violent. But now when you talk about gaming, for good, what comes to my mind is that uh, I'm learning uh, a good behavior. I'm using uh, the game to learn something positive, to change my behavior, to change my attitude towards something. For instance, uh, when you look at uh, some of the education tools that have been tested and tried out uh, across the different parts of the globe, uh, for instance, uh, India, Japan, and other parts, even here in Uganda, we are testing one of the tools. Here we are hoping young children to change their attitude towards certain uh, behaviors. For instance, it was aimed at changing their attitude towards child marriage. Therefore, gaming for good is aimed at promoting uh, uh pro social behavior yeah thank you thank you um i'll also now invite dennis nono to add on to this question yes speaking broadly about um the impact of these games. Uh, I I've had experience uh, working around children exposed to a number of uh, this kind of games, both social games. We, we realized that we, 
we expose them to a number of issues in the society. And this not, not only brings about the cyber bullying aspects, but it also um, gives them the mandate to always try to work around their peers towards antisocial behavior. That's one disadvantage of, uh, of using this for social games. But uh, in terms of uh, averting gender-based violence or child marriages or gender biases, there can be individual differences in terms of development, development and well-being where um, children create a way where they can interact interpersonally and they can easily tackle issues that affect them. This also influences group functioning and it becomes quite easy for um, the adult beings to solve problems affecting children. In terms of uh, creating um, an empathic, uh, like empathy in the, uh, in the behaviors of children, there's a lot that we can see uh, whenever they're exposed to games like this and there's uh, self-control because a child can use these games uh, individually and later on realize the impact, either positively or negatively. So uh, broadly speaking, I think uh, these games have uh, a very great advantage. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Uh, we go to the next question. And this goes to Ashish first. How has gaming evolved for good in the, rec in the recent years? That is for both gamers and the game developers. Hi, Sharon. Thanks for the question. But uh, could you repeat the question as there was some disturbance in the network? Yeah, I think there's there's some something happening on Sharon's end. I can just repeat it for you. How has gaming evolved to be for good in recent years, both for gamers and game developers? Okay, that's, uh, that's quite a question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, gaming and uh, gaming is evolving as technology is and uh, in uh, like if we look at uh, something like 12, 20 years ago there was just 2d games like pong and all and uh, people still used to make games with elaborate stories and uh, now we have 3d graphics and they are improving to have uh, lifelike graphics and uh, uh, and now we have VR and AR where we can be inside the game that we wish for and live the stories of our uh, characters we imagine. And uh, that's really uh, amazing. And it totally changes the way we perceive games and stories. Um, and uh, I think uh, I had one of the earliest moments where, where I... Uh, uh, got into love for virtual reality was in one of the workshops where I saw one of these experiences where uh, you can uh, body swap uh, a male and a female body and see through the eyes of the opposite genders and uh, uh, see what problems they face in their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, looking at that through VR was uh, an, a brilliant experience and uh, changed my perspective a lot. So uh, I believe uh, the role of technology in uh, changing the way uh, we can build experiences that can have uh, impacts for social change and uh, gaming for good is uh, huge and immense. And uh, we should try to incorporate new ways because they, are, they stand out just because of being new. And uh, we can use that potential to have a greater impact. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Ashish. Um, I'll, I'll ask the same question now to Alankrit for your thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's a very good question. And just like Ashi said, games have evolved uh, through the years. So um, it's still considered probably as a, a massive entertainment 
it's entertainment source um but that tide is gradually changing is my personal perspective of it because um if you think about it um art games and serious games are becoming slowly more prevalent in uh, in the uh, market and uh having access to such games uh if you if you if you see like serious games when they're done really well they they generate a lot more uh, conversation around certain topics that you want people to have more awareness about and art games too when um they they basically made only for you know visually like i mean uh, appreciating the visual aesthetic of the game but when you do pay more attention into the narrative and the context that some of these art games uh, have you know that uh, they make you think about uh, the topic a lot more uh, for instance i learned a lot about world war through world war 2 through an art game so there there's a lot uh, that games are doing nowadays to help people understand things that they don't know about it's becoming more more than an entertainment tool and i i think i've observed that trend in the last few years okay thank you very much ala chris and now i'll invite what the our first lady on the panel so uh elisa could you uh where do you see the gaming industry going in the next 5 years specifically for your country thank you sharon um i would just like to add uh, a little bit to previous questions i think it's very very powerful games because you do things they are interactive and none none other tools like animation or videos or or films have that super talent so role playing trial and error feedback um managing resources um all these different things um actually make you uh, make these very powerful tools so it's not a coincidence that the military and the companies are training their people with games so education um is part of the same trend because we've been discovering as years pass that uh, these tools can have a lot of possibilities um right now for example there's a conference um called serious play uh, in the states which is also a huge conference um parallel um in the other side of the world there's these all these teachers trying to think about how to pull games into their schools and it's not very different reality from ours india or mexico i believe or uganda because schools are still very traditional all around the world all around the world they're still um asking for um tests evaluations um all around the world kids are still competing for qualifications so uh we all have the same um problems or issues that we need to 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 get on um which is changing whole systems to try to pull these new tools into into use because as game designers we can create gay tools but if no one uses um uh, it doesn't have much meaning no um i would say that in terms of um production um games in general like uh, have the issue that uh, really big companies are getting bigger and really small companies are getting more difficulty to get into publishing and into distribution because of um it it's a marketing thing uh, as you need uh, money to push these things forward no so uh, the issue there is that um we need to be like guerrilla guerrilla fighters for this no we need to implement smoothly into into little spaces and think that that will correspond later on no um and the other thing is that games are um, serious games um we've been seeing and studying that they're quite old as the entertainment world they they started parallel and they were something like in the 80s and 90s there were a lot of serious games they were more serious games than now and there were all the big ones wanted to create um serious games then so we have the mario series we have world in the world is carmen san diego oregon trail all of these from the 80s then they disappeared and now it's uh, flushing again no it's coming back uh we we we're starting to see a lot of developing 
Um, so it's a very interesting thing that we are on it just uh, as, it, as it goes up. No? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elisa. I think we can actually ask the same question to our panelists from the other countries as well to tell us how the industry has been going in their countries. Maybe we can start with Craig telling us about the UK. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I think increasingly there's just so much choice available for players in terms of what's out there. Um, you're not stuck to the same marketplaces and, and monopolies really anymore. It's, it's so open. And for very little money, you can go and have this wide library of games that you've got access to and hours and hours of time to put away. Um, I think that's going to present a challenge for serious games and maybe not in a bad way. It's just going to mean that serious games have to start adapting and have to start um, maybe not so much adapting as taking on some on board some of these points that the big developers are already using. So if we start looking at player experience, user experience, and we start looking at what makes these games fun mechanically and what makes people want to keep playing these mainstream games, um, perhaps more needs to be done in bringing these into the serious games uh, would be my answer to that. Um, in terms of technology, I think virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, I know it's a bit of a cliche answer to say they're going to get bigger. I, I'm not sure augmented reality is going to get bigger in the same way that it is at the moment. Um, I think particularly with AR, you're going to look at wearables and that kind of technology driving that forward. And I think increasingly that's going to be a lot bigger, particularly in the serious market. Um, uh, yeah, th that's that's my answer to that, really. Sorry, I, I started rambling. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Craig. Um, now we go to Uganda, and we ask this question still to to Dennis Agaba. Where do you see the gaming industry going in the next five years? Let's look at Uganda in particular. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting uh, hearing stories from other countries. Uh, I like the presentation Dr. Esther made about the trial that was done for that game in Uganda. And uh, when she was asked about the challenges, you had her talk about uh, kids seeing a laptop for the first time, you know, admiring the laptop, the mouse, and all those other things. So you realize that, um, of course, the, one of the biggest challenges that you have in Uganda is uh, the accessibility to these devices for kids to be able to play the games. And that's why you find that most of us are still playing games live. So of course, with the COVID now, we cannot play games anymore because we can't gather the kids, we can't gather people. So that's why we are now forced to get to the video games because we can play the games when we are not there. So the biggest issue that we are having here is that bit of uh, the, the technology advancement where the children have the ability to use these devices to play the games, for example. But there is uh, light at the end. I'm glad that trial shows that there is a good future for the games in Uganda. Uh, I would love to read the report further to find out especially how it did in Gulu, Amur, all those districts in northern Uganda, uh, because that's where the, the, the kids don't have access to the computers, to the you know, smartphone and all those other things. But I'm seeing that in the next years, there is a good opportunity for us to actually have this uh, realized, the gaming realized, because uh, she also talked, doctor also talked about the, the new curriculum that is being developed and uh, where ICT is one of the major issues being uh, emphasized in all subjects, ICT is, 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 is a part of it, so that the children, the young people can be able to operate these devices and be able to play uh, the games. So I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel that in the next few years, we shall be at a certain level. Thank you, back to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis Agaba. 
it's very clear that um, also the Ugandan industry is going to evolve slowly. So I want to take the same question to, to James Thomas Enfuma. Where do you see, as a person who participated in the games trials of Uganda, where do you see the games industry in the next five years? Yeah, thank you, Sharon, uh, for that question. Of course, now when we talk about uh, the gaming industry in Uganda, what I can say is that it is developing. And as one of the participants uh, during the implementation of the trial for nine in three, what I discovered or learned that among the schools where we piloted the game, of course, uh, as uh, Dennis has noted, there is lack of accessibility to the infrastructure such as uh, the computers, uh, but also if we are thinking about targeting all children within the country, uh, there are those children who don't uh, who are not in school. So probably uh, maybe now that there is an increase, we are in. Uh, we are talking about technological development that is taking place where we have uh, more access to smartphones. I'm pretty sure that uh, there is going to be an increase in terms of uh, uh, the number of game users uh, or game players within the country in the next couple of years. And of course, uh, now this depends on which uh, type of game that children are going to be exposed to. Currently, you find that uh, most children want to play video games and actually do play them, especially boys. However, they have to uh, access these games at a cost. You find that maybe they go in a uh, internet cafes where they pay some amount of money and play the game for probably maybe 30 minutes or uh, depending on the charges uh, per duration. But now, if at all we are talking about games, one of them is uh, the cost of implementation. If we have these games, for instance, of course, uh, we shall need to uh, find out the sustainability of these games within the country. So if at all these games can be accessed by uh, students, uh, that is through the smartphones of their parents, probably if at all we are talking about gaming for good, then I'm pretty sure that uh, access to uh, use of these video games is going to increase. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, James. Thank you very much, James. Still on the same question, I would love to drive it to uh, Ponima. Ponima, where do you see the gaming industry in India in the next five years? Thanks, Sharon. Uh, and I think it was wonderful to hear all the different perspectives and some of them definitely align as well, right? So what James and Dennis were talking about uh, in tier two, tier three cities of India, that's a similar case. Uh, I, I remember in my startup when we were trying to make a game that was teaching gender sensitivity, and this was definitely a problem where there was just one computer system in the entire school. So then how do we make people play, right? And then we had to change the model. And then there is the issue of localization. We have way too many languages. Do we put all of that in or do we actually just make it part of the gameplay where language is not a mandate anymore? Um, so there are these kind of things to deal with. And I think uh, what even Elisa said, like, you know, we started off in this phase of uh, serious games and games that talk about different aspects of history and all of that. And then we have moved into the larger entertainment spectrum. And I think that kind of also aligns with a lot of what the movie industry does, right? Uh, we all started that way and then largely became more of an entertainment sector. And now that we see the potential of that medium, we are also looking at a lot more, uh, you know, more relevant topics discussed even in movies. And the same thing is happening with gaming. And also gamification has now become such a big thing where the potential of what games can do with an interactive medium is being adapted everywhere, uh, be it education, healthcare, and all of that. With respect to specifically India and the gaming industry, the one trend that I can clearly see is the aspect of uh, more Indian culture centric games that are coming out. A lot of focus is being there, like you know, trying to bring out what India is or Indian history or mythology based content is coming across. And we can see that coming from the indie community versus the larger corporations, because at the end of the day, business is business. And uh, those games, the free to play games, which is a larger sector in India, the mobile market is much more uh, bigger compared to any other industry. So then 
those are the games that take priority from larger corporations and the funding also comes through for those. Uh, but we are definitely seeing a slight movement in this and uh, there are funds, there are conferences that engage this and promote these kind of games to give them the uh, prominence that they require. And the more we do that, and I think it's just going back to what history had, right? Like at one point, gaming was hardly an industry. A bunch of people came together, pushed it, failed, continue to push it. And today it's, it's a billion dollar industry. And I think the same thing will happen for the kind of pro-social games that we are trying to make and make it common, uh, make it something that is not something that stands out, right? It, it becomes a, such a common uh, commodity for us to consume. I think we will get there, but there's still time. Thank you, over to you. Thank you for that. I think that's such an interesting thought for pro-social video games to become the norm and, and not the exception. Um, and I, I have to also commend all of the other panelists for all of their inputs on this, especially Elisa, you pointing out that serious games have actually been around for a very long time. They just disappeared for a while. So on that note, one of our objectives as None in 3 is to use research and extract lessons that can be used to develop anti-gender-based violence video games aimed at changing cultural, social, religious, and other attitudes towards gender-based violence. So this question is sort of about what the process of developing such a game is, which many of our panelists have experience with. So as a game designer, how has the process of creating a game meant to sensitize and teach young people about gender-based violence been? Um, I, I'm going to throw this open to the panel. Whoever would like to go first, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll point to you. Yes, Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. I'll, I'll approach this with a very simple uh, story about my five-year-old son. Uh, this five-year-old does not eat greens. So whatever food you prepare, he would not eat anything that has greens in it. So if it is avocado, if it is uh, those green vegetables, he would first remove them and put them aside and eat the good looking food, which is yellow, you know, the, the matoke and all that. So I had a problem with him because I wanted him to eat the greens because the greens are good for him, but he didn't want to know that. So while I was sleeping, I thought of a, a solution, uh, developing a simple game on how I can make him understand that eating greens is actually very, very important. So I developed a game where we would use bottle tops to play, but this, this is like it's not on computer. I'm trying to adopt it for, for, for uh, as a video game of some sort, but we played it live and you would select the food which, uh, to make a balanced diet, and whichever food you'd select, you would for, uh, fight a certain disease. A disease was also there in a piece of paper. So you eat starch, you fight disease A. You eat greens, you fight disease B. So we, as we played, he reached a point where he had to select greens. But there was a disease on top of greens. If you don't eat it, you. So he reached greens, he dodged the greens. So I brought the piece of paper and put it in his plate. I'm like, now this is the disease that has caught you because you don't have greens. He's like, oh, oh, I have this disease because I haven't eaten greens. I'm like, yes. He's like, no, I am asking you daddy to let me make another choice. So I'm like, go ahead. So you put the disease, acted the green. So by the time we finished playing the game, he knew the advantage or the benefits of eating greens. So later on, when we were going to eat dinner, the greens was, of course, served. So I waited for him to see whether he's going to serve the greens. And indeed, he served the greens. He ate it, and nothing happened. So it showed me that the games, the, the process, of course, starts from what is it that you want to achieve. For example, uh, we are dealing with gender-based violence. First, know the objective. What is it that you want to change? then it will give you the process of developing a game that will help you to arrive at that. So without that objective, you might not be able to develop the, the game. So the rest of the panelists can add on that, but uh, I observe that the process, you need to have the objective first and then start from scratch 
to go through the game so that it can help you reach there at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was such a fun analogy about a young person's outlook towards food. Um, I'll, I'll now invite Elisa to tell us about her experience in designing a pro-social game to fight GBV, which was Chuka. Um, thank you. Yes, I'd like to share what happened with Chuka because I think it's um, a good example of the challenges Purnima was, was uh, sharing in terms of languages. I, um, this game was asked by the UN and they suddenly want these um, video games that can actually be played in all sorts of different places in the world, which is very, very difficult. No, it's not the same to, to try out uh, violence issues in Mexico where there's uh, 10 feminicides a day, um, as it is in Vienna where the people that um, contracted us to create the game um, deal with, no? So this universality of games uh, for our type of games is an issue. Um, um, I really, we, we, we tried to do it. We know that kids don't read. So what we did is we, we solved that with emojis. And we discovered something very interesting interest in terms of violence um, and kids. And we saw the power of images and not words by using images. So during the game, you encounter with different creatures that, deal, um, that are violent in different ways or won't be violent. Um, it, it, they are like people, no? They can be or not be. Um, and once you encounter them, you have a dialogue in emojis. Um, and when they do something to you, it's an image. So if they're touching you, it's an image of a hand uh, touching. Um, so actually kids tend to see that and it's very difficult for them to open up and say things loud of things that they've happened or that they, the things that they've lived um, that they feel ashamed of. So um, what the game did, and we, we were like, the, um, it, 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 it just happened no? to, to, to function. We, we didn't realize what we were doing. So it's very interesting to be a game designer, try things out and they can be or not be a good, um, a, a good try, but it happened to be a very interesting thing to see children speaking out their violence up. And that happened to me or that happened to my cousin or that happened to my aunt. And for me, even at the moment, it's being played. There's 250,000 um, downloads, which is quite a, a thing for a serious game that doesn't have a marketing or a publisher. Um, obviously, it's the United Nations that pushes these things out. But the thing there is that um, the problem is the implementation, as it has been said here. Uh, there's no one to accompany this process. Uh, there's no one to take these kids. Once they've pulled out their violence, there's no one that can actually um, give them the support um, to go through these issues. And so we have to be responsible of what we throw away with these things. It's like when, when we go into a town and try to do social help and we're just changing things around and then moving out and leaving a mess instead of a something like good, no? So this responsibility, um, especially in, in places, uh, Mexico has institution problems all over the place. So you cannot approach police, you cannot approach um, justice. So um, it's, we, we, we need to cope in small little responsible things, I think. Um, so it's, it's very, very interesting in terms of, of Chuka and what will come because it's still living there. And as been, has been said, there are schools in Mexico that don't have like only one computer. So my, uh, what we've done is that we've done very small games in terms of, of, of capacity uh, and you can download them, you can play offline, you can to, just to try out these different issues of usability. We have like board games of the game or comics in, if there's no computer. So when doing these sort of social things, we can just try out different formats to, to complement. Thank you, Elisa. That's, that's very valuable insight into your process. And I think some advice also on what 
up and coming game makers can can use and congratulations on how much your game is being played and has been downloaded i think it truly is an achievement for a serious game um i see chaitanya your hand is raised what dennis uh, the process that dennis described i i think i can very crudely put it as baiting and switching uh, where dennis intentionally baited uh, his child with uh, game mechanics and then switched it for real life learning you can actually see that now because you asked for on ground experience i would rather give subjective and anecdotal experience there's this game uh, called detroit become human and i think many people might have Uh, might be informed about it it's a game which is where uh, ai and artificial intelligent robots have permeated the humanity and they're being used as house help and that games rely that game relies heavily on choice making so i think choice making would be very important in this particular case the player has no idea that he'll be set up in a house or he or she they'll be set up in a house where they will be able to make choices for a female robot and that female robot uh, is unfortunately put into a house of an alcoholic an abusive alcoholic who uh, verbally i don't know whether sexually or not but physically and verbally definitely abuses her daughter and it is found out that earlier in the game he had already dismantled violently dismantled this robot before this female robot before at that point of the time the user actually you know i i always feel that game developers should not shy away from from drama because most of my learning would have gotten and i have been playing games since i've gained my declarative uh, declarative memory uh, they should not shy away from trauma because certain trauma if you can see telltale games uh, telltale games you have choice if you play walking dead uh, i forget the name of the child but there's a man who has to take care of a small girl child in the case of a zombie outbreak and at in the last sorry spoilers coming ahead the person dies and uh, the the girl is left alone and that is when the player actually feels very bad because his choices their choices have been the reason why the man uh, in the end died and they had developed uh, this relationship so then comes vulnerability what will the girl do that is revealed in the next game but what will the girl do where will she go there have already been instances in the game where she was uh, people try to take uh, they try to exploit the girl so baiting and switching using small doses of trauma i think is is a very useful i understand it can it can slip away very quickly but i think it is a very useful mechanic that can be employed thank you thank you for that chaitanya alankrit go ahead um yeah i just want to add on to that point because um if you if you think about it game designers have to especially in these sort of situations we have to come up with uh, uh mechanics and also narratives and scenarios that you know create a safe space for the players because unless the player feel safe they wouldn't want to make those choices so that is one challenge that uh, you can experience with uh, when you're making a game for like you know educating about like sexual harassment gender based violence uh and other such topics which are also like considered taboo in current society because people may not be very forthcoming to talk about them or play something of that so of that sort so the the two main things that we have to do as a game designers one we have to disguise the learning so they, they shouldn't uh actually know that they're being taught or they're being asked about these questions in a very forthcoming format and the second thing is we have to create that safe space for them because um once you create that psychological safety then they start to open up and then uh, you see that through the narrative context even if you make it as close to a simulation as it is in a real life context they start making choices that uh, would relate and would help them if the situation happens in real life and you can see uh, if uh, if you do research later on you would be able to actually point out that uh this is what they were doing before but after playing the game they've done something different because the game created that safe space for them to learn yeah i think i think that's so important and it's it's part of what nan in 3 is also trying to do with their games which is uh, you know like what elisa mentioned which is why implementation is also so important in terms of what environment these games are played in and what modules go along with it purnima you'd like to add something yeah uh, just a tiny point uh, i think i completely agree with what everyone said and just adding to that is if you have watched westworld right uh, this is a series where it's all about what will you do in a world there are no consequences 
right? And uh, that's exactly what most people come into games for. There are no consequences in real life. You actually go ahead and play it anyway. So now you start introducing these consequences in the game and then make them put them in that moral conundrum to think. Like uh, GTA is always termed as this most violent game, right? To be honest, I have done the same thing that everyone has and most of us have. What if when you're killing the prostitute, right now there's no consequence, but after that you actually hear her story of what happened because she lost her life. Imagine putting that in GTA. Do you really think that many people will go ahead and continue to kill them? So these kind of things you can actually do. And this is just like a foot for thought on how even traditional games, you can just put that element of consequence and conundrum and we could start asking these questions. Thank you so much. I think on that note, I'll move on to the second part of the question. So, so far we talked about the process of designing a, a game like this, which is meant to combat gender-based violence. So what has been the on-ground experience of implementing a game like this, which I think James, you've been a part of that process. So would you like to tell us a bit more? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, now when we talk about uh, this question about uh, the lessons that can be used to develop ecologically sound and TPV video games. Uh, of course, one of the things I think it was earlier noted by uh, Dr. Esther Navka in our presentation and actually I had also suggested it, that uh, we need to develop games uh, that can, uh, that are in relation to our cultural context, for instance, here in Uganda, we have many tribes and they speak, uh, of course, local languages, despite the fact that English is the official language. However, I think it is really very, very imperative uh, to develop games which uh, in local languages, that way it, it would be easier for students or learners to understand these uh, games, the message in the games. Because at times they play for fun, uh, of course, uh, even when they don't understand the English, uh, words uh, or meanings of the sentences being used. Because trust me, however much English is the official language, somebody studies from primary up to secondary, they may not be able to understand or comprehend some of the English words or statements. But also what I've learned that it is uh, really very, very good to develop a game uh, where your characters uh, can be easily related to uh, real life situations. So students or learners, we are happy to see that actually some of the characters were similar to the real life situations within our communities. Eh? Uh, even the environment within the games, when we talk about that is peace video game, we had, for instance, the marketplace. Eh? They could easily relate to what was in the, uh, what is in the markets within Uganda. When you talk about the border, border rider, hmm? Uh, because these are among the perpetrators of uh, GPV. So when you talk about uh, a border border rider in that video game, a border border rider meaning a motorcycle uh, rider, because they normally provide services to people, transporting them from one place to another. So you find that uh, learners uh, felt happy that actually now in this game, I'm seeing a border border rider. Rather than uh, playing a game where you have, uh, say, people going to the moon or using uh, space shuttles, eh? it may not be uh, appropriate in terms of addressing GBV. So uh, it is uh, really also very, very important, but also the channels, uh, the reporting mechanisms or systems, they should be clearly depicted within the game, uh, whereby if at all I face a problem or if at all somebody, a friend uh, is faced with a problem in relation to GBV, specifically child marriage, they can be able to identify the systems within the community, it could be uh, maybe in the country where they can easily report. For instance, in that peace video game, uh, we provided, for instance, uh, the number for the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, that in case somebody uh, felt like they want to share something uh, in relation to GBV, if at all maybe their friend or colleague is faced with GBV, how can be, they be supported? So it would be easier for them to report that. But also I think um, what I also learned, uh, if I can remember, of course, uh, students made some suggestions uh, when it comes to game development, eh, that uh, when we are designing these games, uh, it is important for people in the games, for instance, to change clothes eh, 
for instance, in that uh, this video game, you find that uh, this uh, piece, the character, the main character, was in the same attire from the start up to the end. Hmm? So they were suggesting, and yet uh, they were playing on a different what day. So it is important to also change that. Uh, for instance, clothing attire. If you talk about, uh, say, um, an action, hmm, it should match with the uh, words that are being said or displayed on the screen. If you are talking about sweeping the compound, hmm, the character should be depicted or shown uh, sweeping the compound, not just necessarily saying that uh, a task completed, yet you've not seen the character uh, sweeping or doing anything. But also I think it is important to add more uh, information in relation to our local communities. For instance, the children suggested that it is important at least to have some of the animals, it could be domestic birds because they didn't see them. Here in the Ugandan context, uh, in a homestead, normally at least we have some domestic animals and birds. For instance, it could be goats at home, it could be uh, cows, it could be um, uh, another birds like chicken, it could be um, anything. So it is important to also uh, involve them or put them when it, in the game. So that is it what I can remember for now. And I think, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, James. I think that's very, very insightful. And it sort of mentioned some of the points the other panelists have made about the challenges of deploying a game like this, especially in, say, tier two, tier three cities where access to technology is, is difficult. Um, if nobody else wants to add to that, I think I will pass it to Sharon for the next question. Uh, thank you very much, Ishani. So my next question goes to uh, Dennis Nono from AfroChild. So um, what impact has pro social game had on influencing people on global issues like GBV? Uh, Dennis, you're on, you're on mute. Could you please accept my prompt to unmute? Yes. Yes, GBV and other social problems are still critical issues and uh, challenges in the world right now. But uh, for social games and other gaming activities are very helpful in informing the targeted audiences on aspects that, in, that can influence um, social change. So this kind of gaming has uh, improved the thought processes on aspects of, aspects of perpetration of their rights and um, the level of messaging in terms of how it has been packaged. You know, uh, the targeted audiences, including children, do have a very keen interest in understanding some of the unique features in the games, as already mentioned by some of the, the previous speakers. This helps them to improve the understanding and association with this kind of games and it influences a lot of positive change. Um, also the use of arti artificial artifacts or uh, representations like birds, animals or things that really catch the attention of uh, targeted audiences improves their uh, involvement and concentration like already mentioned by someone. The tone and the language um, we use in understanding of some of these underlying social problems are uniquely integrated and it, it, it improves um, how we can influence positive change uh, in terms of understanding of GBV, uh, intimate partner, partner violences or, or even child marriages. This kind of games do instill confidence in children or um, other targeted audiences. Um, for example, if you understand that uh, in this game we had a reporting system and someone can uh, go to this specific uh, uh, place of reference, people get the, the confidence to move on and uh, try to um, seek help. And later on, that is a part of change. There's a lot of uh, empathy and behavioral self-control in children when they um, articulately involve themselves in this kind of uh, social games, because in the end, they will know how to tackle some of these uh, social problems and there are uh, social practitioners around them 
can improve um, in, uh, in solving this kind of problems. Besides, uh, I think there is also um, limited utilization of this uh, for social games at the moment. And um, like Afar mentioned, uh, utilization of electric uh, or electronic gadgets like PCs, tablets, netbooks, um, even if the children have very high level of interest in using this kind of games, they have very limited knowledge and uh, this affects the utilization of the book for social games. I think that's what I can talk about. In terms of okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, still, this question goes to you. Please don't go off. Um, has it been, or has it been useful in places or culture like Uganda to use a game? Has it been very useful? Please unmute yourself, Dennis. Dennis, you're mute. Culture is steadily uh, changing, although, um, you know, it's never static and there's always change in a society like this. In Uganda, for example, um, there are very few gamers, like everyone in this panel knows, but then a little is, a little is changing in terms of um, cultural attachments. People are understanding that um, if you use some of these measures to improve social change, many things can happen. Although in specific communities, including mine, where I come from, um, culture is still an impediment, where um, most of the people still think um, usage of this kind of technologies is not very influencing uh, in terms of causing change to them. Rather, they would uh, go, go via the tradition of it. Of it. But with the, with the team here, um, a lot can be done by sensitizing and improving their interactions and also creating some social connections where we can easily influence uh, other members who join this gaming for social games. Okay, uh, thank you, Dennis. I'll still draw the same question to Craig, our game designer for the Nan in 3. So um, Craig Gibbs. What social what impact has pro social gaming had on influencing pro social or social problems like GBV? Um, this, I'll be honest, this really isn't my side. I'm on the production side, but I, I can do my best to give an answer. Um, it's it's really good and really positive to see the feedback coming out of schools, like we saw in the previous the previous presentation. The fact that it's actually making a difference and kids are engaging with it. And it just shows what can be done with this kind of game, really. And I think, again, with games as opposed to films and, and maybe traditional media, you can place someone in that story. So they're going to experience that as though they were there. And I think that opens up so many possibilities and in itself opens up a lot of room and opportunity for, for causing this kind of wide change in society almost. Because you're almost leaving someone with the impression that they've gone through this experience, they've gone through this story. Um, and, and to go back as well, I mean, this also feeds in with keeping these games culturally appropriate and culturally sensitive, because if they're not, I mean, you're impacting on that right away. If, if someone's playing through this as themselves and they see something that's not quite right and it can be something really small, it could be clothing or, you know, a telegraph pole or something that just should not belong, it, it pulls them out of that immersion and it can be done just like that. And, and you can just break all the hard work that's gone into building up that immersion and getting that change to sit with them it can just be lost. So it's a really it's a really fine balancing act sometimes between working with the resources you've got, um, which may not be the most all the time. Uh, it's it's fine suggesting some changes, but you don't always have the power or ability or hours to, to, to make them all um, and, and keeping it as appropriate as you can within that. And I think that's how you, you can cause the, the biggest change using games. I hope that's an appropriate answer. Yes, that's an appropriate answer. There's no answer that you just wrong here. So we are here, we are learning from each other. And thank you very much, Craig. Thank you for walking the journey with us. Um, so we shall go uh, straight to other panelists. If any of you would love to add on to this question, please raise up your hand. I see Elisa. Elisa, you want to Um, yes, I, I would. I would like to to say that sometimes, um, as the the conditions are not the best for digital games, um, 
play is an important part of games, not the digital part. So role playing for um, to treat violence in kids, Dennis can tell exactly uh, better the thing that I can uh, if he works with theater. Um, it's 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 so powerful that to to use play as a tool to to teach that it doesn't matter it's not a video game no so um, you can do a board game you can do some cards you can even use Facebook uh, or Google as a tool to create a game you can use Instagram you can use whatever to create a game um, no need to do the super production no need to do the uh, like a big issue out of it. And there's many things that can be done with that. Um, the animals learn by playing. We learn by playing as, as we're small and, and adults. So just to, to say that, uh, not to get afraid of, of, of these huge things called video games, no? because sometimes it looks like imp an, an impossible path. No? OK, thank you very much, uh, Elisa. Um, anyone else who would love to add on this, onto this question? Before we go to the next session, which is the questions, we have people interacting on YouTube. Uh, it's quite interesting out there. And we are going to ask you some of the questions. So question number one, this goes uh, to all the game designers. Uh, how has COVID impacted on your work as a game designer? Anyone who would love to answer that? Ashish, yes. Hello, hi again. Yes. So <laughs> I, I can tell you a little story about my graduation project, which has been going on since uh, February last year. And uh, I had actually joined in uh, a game design studio in Goa, uh, that's in India. And uh, um, I started working over there and uh, then the next month pandemic happened and uh, everything changed. And uh, uh, the work over there, which I was supposed to do was also in the domain of uh, social impact. Uh, I was working with the team to work on uh, mental health uh, and we were supposed to make uh, uh, collecting stories from various people suffering from mental health issues and illnesses and uh, gathering their research and data and uh, creating narrative out of that and converting that to uh, interactive physical installations, which will be like, uh, and, uh, and the project was named as Man Mela, which is Hindi for uh, a playground for your mind. So uh, it was supposed to be a place where people can come in and freely talk about their mental health. There would be some fun installations, uh, giving people an opportunity to play and uh, uh, explore and also talk about uh, in terms of stories about uh, what they are dealing with. Um, and a little pilot of that we were able to do just in February, but after pandemic, we had to uh, sort of pivot to uh, everything digital and uh, uh, which is where things started to uh, like get a little troubling. Uh, and that project also, uh, I, I had to, it was also getting difficult for me uh, personally living over there um, to continue the project uh, just because of the pandemic, uh, pandemic after effects. And uh, on the side, I was also doing my uh, project, which uh, later turned out to me by master's uh, thesis project, which I uh, work with Kaziranga National Park. And uh, I work with them to make a installation project in Assam, uh, where we would talk about uh, the uh, awareness, where we would uh, want to create awareness about elephant train hits, and uh, which is like a serious problem in terms of uh, uh, elephant mortality rates in India. And uh, uh, we created two installations for that. And uh, that turned out to be good, but that project stretched from uh, a thought uh, from uh, like a span of three months 
to over a year so a lot of changes happened because of pandemic uh, lots of things were involved in that uh, i moved in from uh, four different places to finish that project but uh, ultimately we were able to do that so uh, that's uh, my story about pandemic thank you uh, thank you very much uh, ashish um, you've showed us that despite covid we can still find ways of maneuvering and then still doing things so uh ponima your hand was up before denis agava Oh, no. Okay. So, uh, Dennis Agaba, you have something to add on this? Thank you, Sharon. Uh, the pandemic, uh, from my side, I would say it came with the two sides, the positive and the negative. Uh, like, of course, uh, Dennis had said that we are few gamers in Uganda, especially video games. Uh, most of us have been doing these games live with people uh, in the communities, with kids in schools, with what. But I had it had not occurred to me that actually a time would come in future where you can't gather people to play a game, for example, live with them. So when the pandemic hit, that is when I was uh, I was supposed to be in the north. Uh, in the, uh, it's called Kitgum and Amuru and all those districts to work with uh, groups of young people. But when the pandemic hit, I wouldn't go there. So I sat back home and started to think on, I mean, the future, what's the future of this kind of job that I do? So I realized that I need to start thinking uh, the digital uh, world now of how to engage people when you're miles away but still achieve the same objective. So that's when I started to sit back and think of how to adapt these games I've been playing live with the, these people uh, digitally. Uh, my IT is not up there, but uh, I, I am learning and I'm, I'm glad that uh, this project is there. So we are going to now to start to, to, to put it on another level because uh, it, it's a learning that we that came after the pandemic, because right now we are in the total lockdown. We cannot move. We cannot engage people. So if we had uh, video games, we would. To do our work without being there. For now, but then I've learned technology to have these games now to uh, on in video, and uh, I would be glad to uh, just like a suggestion that maybe this doesn't end here. For some of us who are still at the lower level, we could engage and maybe network with the Shaitanya, the Lisa, the Craig, and and you know create games together. Uh, Craig, also, Craig also mentioned something to do with uh, um, being culturally sensitive when you're creating these games. Craig might not develop the best game for Uganda, but I can create and he might be a good designer to design it for me, but when I have the script, for example. <laughs> so the, I, I believe that's the way forward for us. I might not have the ability to design it myself, but maybe Shaitanya would sit down and do the rest, but when the script is from Uganda, so that it speaks to the people that it is meant to impact on. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. That was such a nice uh, note to end on. And I'm so glad that you mentioned collaboration and co-creation because that's really one of the objectives that this conference wants to achieve by bringing so many different people together. And I could see that all of the panelists agree with me with the, with the nodding and the smiling. Moving on to our next question, again, in conjunction with the COVID, do the panelists see any opportunities in pushing pro-social games arising from the increase in technology in education because of COVID? Anandrith, would you like to maybe answer that? Um, sure, yeah, I can try. Um, I think uh, with, with, uh, with education now being online and um, 
at least in the urban centers of india you know you have access to good internet and good infrastructure uh, i think yes games can be used as a medium of uh, education because i remember in school too when we used to have those computer science classes we in primary at least we weren't actually taught uh, how to how to actually do anything it was just like you no know, 40 minutes of us going to the classes and playing games and you know just understanding stuff by ourselves so uh, that those sessions used to be pretty educative so i think now with uh, kids being more tech savvy and at least in the urban centers with us having more uh, access to these resources it's it's definitely possible that um, games can be used in education okay chetanya i see you have your hand up go ahead because the context was for the uh, times of covid let me ask you uh, what uh, do you do if you want to teach someone the basics of handling a rocket the inside of a rocket right what do you do during covid you make a game where five to six people can engage and there is a murder amongst them and then they have to go around taking care of the coolant taking care of the debris taking care of various different things and that game is among us and it it caught on like fire everybody would agree right but in every game see to make pro social games we will always be inclined to to bring in equality right equity but there will always have to be some sort of hierarchy some sort of incentive program where one is able to say yes i am better than better at this yes uh, in this particular case of among us uh, it was the case of some people were streaming like twitch has turned the uh, industry altogether itself but streaming gave some sort of incentive to people being able to collaborate with their friends and then being a good player in that game gave some sort of uh, incentives you know being able to communicate with some friends you know being invited to a game that itself gave some sort of incentives so incentives will definitely help out but there, i feel that there needs to be some sort of hierarchy in pro social games as well because even in society social standings everybody would be looking for some sort of hierarchy everybody wants to rise as as um, as inequal i don't know what what the word is but as bad as it sounds everybody wants to rise up in the ranks so games need to do that as well or at least provide the platform for it that's an extremely interesting take on on, on that and i think james as a social worker may have some interesting insight on your comment about needing hierarchy go ahead james yes okay yes Sure. Thank you. Now, when you talk about pro-social uh, computer video games, I think during the COVID period, it is really a uh, very imperative to engage the different uh, stakeholders. We may not uh, be in position to come up with a concrete plan on how to implement uh, uh, such games during this time, because every sector of the economy is struggling on how to uh, work uh, during this uh, time of period. Right now. we are targeting uh, children for instance who are studying right now they are not in schools but also for instance uh, we need to first get the good will from the government that is the ministry of uh, education if we have it on board and that proves say uh, that uh, video games can be utilized then in uganda right now there is a window of opportunity whereby there is a change uh, in the education curriculum so, so maybe we would have for uh, instance the big pro social computer video games integrated into the curriculum so that it is not uh, played outside learning hours after that was one of the challenges that we faced the learning hours students or children are supposed to play a video game then it would be easier to come up with a way uh, of course uh, in consultation with those other students during the covid period but i believe that uh, it is uh, very important to use this opportunity if it is well planned integrated in the education curriculum then it will become mandatory for children uh, to play the game so that also teachers can dedicate their time towards uh, the game as opposed to just having it but when it is not uh, fully recognized meaning that it will be optional for some um, children or students yet 
uh, these prosocial computer video games are very, very important when it comes to passing out or communicating a message, especially against uh, some of the global challenges like GBV or child marriage, which we are tackling uh, in particular. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, James. Um, most of you have pointed out as panelists, you've pointed out that uh, you've, you've personally learned a lot from the games you've designed. So do you see pro-social games becoming a source of teaching at educational institutions in the future? Let me, anyone who would love to answer this? Yes, Elisa, please go ahead. I would say that I've been pushing in Mexico, at least um, in the Ministry of Education, they, along the years, they have a department to create um, educational material. And I suppose it is the same in India and Uganda that the part of the Ministry of Education create materials for, uh, for kids. In Mexico, we had like a book that is uh, given to all the students around the country for free just to have like a basic instrument for teaching. Um, and that has changed throughout the years. Then we had like um, educational TV and they were these programs where children actually didn't have a teacher in some rural areas and they had, uh, they, they learned through TV. So I, I think we're getting there. And if the Ministry of Education of our country would have in their own department developing tools for games, which is starting to happen, um, then we will then it will smoothly come into the institutions. But for the moment, we are still outside. We are the NGOs, the foundations, the museums, the weird things around the main institutions creating these things. So it's for us, it's just to start pushing that it comes from the inside, that uh, that, that there should be a lab institution. I in, in the UK. For example, the Institute of Education of the University of London creates ideas for games that then they partner with private sector and Nintendo and they create games uh, with educational or so pro-social things. Uh, but it's not, the, it's not the same in all countries. Private and, um, and institutional partnerships are very difficult, um, at least in Mexico. Um, so we need to go um, through government uh, to try to push uh, to see if they can cre start creating. No? But yes, the pandemic sort of pushed things forward like very fastly. No? Like suddenly games were important in schools and games were important but for teaching, no? at least here. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elisa. I will draw this same question to uh, Dennis. Dennis, as a person who works uh, for a research center, within Macquarie University. So uh, do you see pro-social games becoming a source of teaching at educational institutions? Let's look at Macquarie University, where you are, where you see it. Thank you so much. Um, I think this would have been very timely in these trying moments of COVID-19. I, I think if we had these pro-social games in place, at the moment, we would be seeing so many of the students in Makere University utilizing this kind of platform to ensure that um, they get the right information as, uh, as required of them. Um, the practi practicability, the practicability bit of it is uh, quite easy to adapt to, since most of uh, the students right now are grounded into virtual learning and getting to know how things can easily happen. But then there are a number of sessions that require um, practical activities. And I think by the use of this kind of video games, we will be able to practically relay um, information to students in a more um, systematic and easier way. I think we would, we would really embrace that if, if you have that opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I think in the interest of time, we'll have to take just one answer per question so we can get through all of them. That said, I'll, I'll ask the next question now. As we go forward, how do we make sure we don't leave children with disabilities behind? 
do any of the panelists have experience of games for children with hearing or sight disabilities? Uh, Craig, maybe this is this is your area of expertise that you could add on in terms of creating games. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think it's important to be accessible as possible. There's lots of stuff in big studios being done for this already. If you look at what was done with uh, The Last of Us 2, for example, I mean, that's a huge big budget mainstream game and they, they accommodated for, for a whole range of accessibility issues, I think, disabilities and lack of control input uh, and all these things. Um, so I think it's very important. I think a lot more needs to be done on it at, at smaller studio level. I think it's being overlooked a little bit along with the overall user experience at maybe the mid to small level. Um, I think it's just important to, you'd have to gather as much data, data as you could on, on on the um, on the audience you're looking at, really, and making sure that you address any needs within that audience. Um, but but in terms of having novel off the shelf solutions for it, that there's not a whole lot available at the moment, um, which is why you're not seeing such a uniform response to it. I think across across the mid and downwards, um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, generally the bigger studios tend to lead, and everyone else follows, right? So if you look at the success of something like The Last of Us Two and how they've how they've woven all those accessibility options in, I think you'll start seeing that roll out across the smaller and up. Um, but as for an easy solution to it, I don't think there is one. I think it's just got to be addressed as you find it. Thank you for the easy question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Craig. And then I'll, I'll, I'll take this to, um, to Dennis, who has designed uh, games uh, for the community. How, how best can we balance between learning and entertainment? Uh, you, Sarah. <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, message behind is you want to, uh, the children to play as they learn. But how do you make sure that they don't play uh, okay, how do you balance the? Is it 50 50? Is it 60 40? What should be the percentage of learning? What should be the percentage of entertaining? Uh, I'll use an example of uh, it's, it's, it's just a radio drama, a radio serial drama that we developed around 156 episodes. But the, the, we took the choice of the 70 30 percent entertainment, 70 and then 30% uh, education, educative. Why did we do that? Because we don't want to pack all the information and spoil the game. Uh, I think one of the panelists talked about uh, something to do with uh, having to, to, to do a lot of education and yet it's a game they're, they're supposed to be playing. So they shouldn't discover that they are learning until the end. So I think that's why we decided to take the 70, 30%. And at the end of the day, why did we do that? Because we, we want the game to, to move on, the entertainment to move on. And then at the end of the day, that's when they discover that they are learning something. Otherwise, even when they are starting to play the game, as a developer, I think they shouldn't actually get to know that we are playing this game to learn. Maybe they can have a bias. So it, 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 you call them, say, this is a game you're going to play and you're going to have fun, but pay attention, not A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And at the end of the day, they're like, wait a minute. I have discovered A, B, C, D in this. And you're like, oh, what did you discover? And then the discussion can start from there. Even when they get back home, they start thinking about the game they played and the choices they made and the mistakes they made. And they start wanting to correct. Maybe if they play it the second time, will they play it the same way they played it yesterday? Or now they have thought about it and they're going to make uh, you know, changes in the decisions they made, just like Shaitanya was saying about the choices. So I think it should be little education and much entertainment, but well thought out so that everything gets to the light when they have finished playing the game. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Dennis. And I think you've slightly even touched upon another audience question, which was about how do we balance learning and entertainment? 
But going back a little bit to what Elisa spoke about public-private partnerships, which I think are extremely important for any kind of social change to happen, a question that we have is that, is there a future for convergence of governments and game makers to educate the public at large? Or does something like this exist already since it could be a source to understand behavioral patterns of society? I know it's a tough question, but it would be very interesting to hear what you have to say. Chaitanya, go ahead. Sorry for hopping on to every question. I, I have that habit, but I just I just have an answer for it. What, what do I do? So uh, yet, just yesterday, I was participating in the last round of something called a Toykathon. Maybe my Indian colleagues might be aware of it. It is a competition hosted by the Indian government. So in it, see, all big corporate, the government itself is a very big corporation, right? They will only aim at it when they see uh, that there is something to be benefited from it. And of course, they can't be on top of, they can't be on top of all the fields that are going on in the country. So they do try, at least in the case of India, they are trying, but it is, am I breaking out? No, okay. So it is the job of the game designers, game researchers, game developers, and game managers to suggest it to the government. Of course, new ideas, all of us know government just cut out new ideas just like that, but they have their reasons. But in India, at least I can see that they have started to at least acknowledge games as something that can either benefit the education sector or the economic benefits that can be gained from it. And especially in the case of India, there are so many cultural games and toys that already exist. As Elisa was saying, don't consider games to be a digital thing. Games, even Ringa Ringa Rosie was a game. It had rewards, it had goals, it had a social interaction, but it was a game meant to inform the players about the uh, great play. So, you know, games are inherent in humans uh, through play. So I don't know why I came to this point, but uh, yeah, I, I hope I answered this uh, question briefly. Yes, you did, Chaitanya. Thank you very much. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, uh, this, this has come from Uganda. It says there's a population that cannot access phones and computers to play video games. What do you think can be done to increase accessibility of these games to such population and ensure that they benefit too? I'll take this to, to James. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sharon, for that. In terms of uh, accessibility, of course, we know very well that a number of uh, caregivers uh, do not own uh, some of the gadgets that are important when it comes to playing games. For instance, when we talk about computers like laptops, very few people own them. Now, when we talk about smartphones, because at least most people can access the video games through the use of smartphones, again, very few people uh, within the Ugandan population can access uh, such gadgets. But also, you find that most of the students, uh, of course, they are students, they don't earn money to buy them. So I think the first point is to enable parents or the caregivers uh, to appreciate the importance and relevance of these uh, pro-social video games. Maybe they have a negative uh, perception towards uh, gaming, but now we need to enlighten them about that importance of pro-social video games, but also to call upon the government to be part of this uh, journey of sensitizing parents. After that, then parents can appreciate this and uh, of course uh, be able to buy for their uh, children these gadgets. For instance, a smartphone can be affordable for a parent. Just assume if at all each household has at least an access to a smartphone, maybe children within that household can be able to access that, uh, to play the game. I mean the pro-social video games. But also now that we are talking about the new curriculum in Uganda that is being scaled up uh, and they are emphasizing the issue of ICT. Mm? And one of the things they might have, they must have access to is I think internet. So how is, how is the government going to go about that? Hmm? The number of challenges, for instance, some people don't have access to, for instance, electricity. And remember when you have a smartphone, you need to charge it. All these are things that need to be uh, discussed carefully and uh, of course find a solution. But of course it goes back as a way of uh, coming up with a sustainability plan 
we are not going to say that we are going to mobilize resources from donors to buy smartphones for uh, people. I believe these parents have the resources. Hmm? Because just imagine within a span of about 10 years, a parent at least can afford to buy a smartphone for their kids if they can buy other school requirements. So I think it goes back to empowering them mentally to appreciate the relevance of this pro-social the phones actually they all need as opposed to giving them uh, these gadgets. So I think that is one of them, but also to tap into uh, other organized structures like schools. Uh, maybe there the government can come in to provide uh, some resources like laptops. We could talk about uh, it could be churches where children gather every Sunday. Maybe again, they can have an opportunity to play such uh, video games and also maybe other social uh, places. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, my next question is a very interesting one. Somebody from the audience asks, what about gender disparity within the gaming industry itself? And I think our, our two female panelists might be the best ones to answer that. Right. Uh, uh, want to go first? Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, it exists. I mean, that's, that's what I would say. It is fairly a male dominated field and it is hard. Um, and it's interesting, we keep talking about how there are more women game, gamers now, right? Uh, when we include the casual domain as well. So uh, e almost about equal uh, uh, percentage of women also play casual games and consume that. But in game development, the universal average is about 20 percentage. And uh, when it comes to countries in itself, like if I consider India, it's much lower. And uh, uh, this is something we have to fix in two levels, right? One is definitely at the grassroots levels where we are talking about how gaming industry can be a great career for uh, women and other marginalized gender, right? From India right now, like we have not even gone there and then we have like an entire section of, uh, you know, genders to cover and get them in there. And some of them don't even have basic education as an access. So that, that gets super tricky then. And uh, the women who are educated, they are looking at something that's more sustainable, that's more, uh, that doesn't make them feel uneasy. Um, to talk about that, when I created the Women in Games India community, um, I, I am part of the larger game dev communities as well. But it's interesting that when we asked for the diverse audience to turn up in the larger community, we did not see as many hits. But when we created a community that's just for women and marginalized gender, we started seeing a lot of them coming together. And when I have asked why, the question, the answer has always been that we feel it's safer. No one will judge us. Uh, that, you know, we may not be as into games as, and to be honest, not every male out there is as interested in games, but they exist in the industry without any kind of prejudice. The moment a woman comes in, it's always been the case. Like personally, I've faced enough bias in my career uh, and still continue to be here because I just didn't want to give up. There has been times when I've decided not to and move industries, but uh, I should also be thankful to some of these amazing male colleagues who continue to encourage me to stay and, you know, give it my all. So it exists. And, but the thing is that we also need a lot of women at top level management without that, no change is happening. It's, it's good. So this comes down to even when we talk about cultural sensitivities, right? This also is gender sensitivities. What a woman has gone through or what a marginalized gender has gone through, even if I'm an ally, I cannot completely understand what the pain problems are. So we need someone who is a representative at the top who will be able to make the right kind of changes. And we need the allies to support them, to push them forward. And until these two things are sorted, we will not be a diverse uh, industry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's such an important point to raise and, and very encouraging words for um, the female and marginalized gender people in our audience who may be wanting to get into this industry. Elisa, would you like to add to that from your experience? Um, yes, just a quick intervention. Statistics say that, as, as Purnima was saying, it, that actually, yeah, we're sort of half and half players, no? More casual players in women and shooters and hardcore gamers in men. 
that's the statistics, no? 20% uh, of the women that are actually in the industry as, 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 as designers are more in, in relations, in, in human relations, uh, in design, in, in illustration and animation, but there's only a 2% in programmers. So there's no, pro, no women programmers in the world. Well, there's, there's very few. So um, it, it's, it's for me um, being developing through 10 years, I've always looked for a women programmer because the, prog the coding is the structure and the structure itself um, has, has, a, has, has a, like a message. Uh, and the core thing has a message uh, because it's 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 the language you're using to to create these things. So I think we need um, children to start with STEAM. I know it's a huge issue around the world. So we need uh, little girls to start being interested in engineering, in maths, in technical issues. I know this is a cliche, but we need to still be pushing through that side. And how? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Role models, probably. <laughs> Thank you, and I, I think you you and Purnima are those role models right now. And this is also such a good reminder to all, all of the men and boys in our audience to maintain and continue to be allies to people that are outside of your gender and support this industry to become much more inclusive and much more useful as well. So going forward now, I'll, I'll move on to our last question as moderators. What are some of the recommendations that the panelists would like to share for people to use gaming as a tool um, or pro-social game recommendations that you may have that they can find in the market or just your message to aspiring young game makers? Should I pick someone? <laughs> Poonima, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I would just say I covered a few of them. They may not necessarily be pro-social. Some of them are. Uh, and I just gave a few examples in the keynote. I think definitely go take a look at those games. Uh, I, I feel even some of the commercially successful ones have managed to bring that kind of element into it. Uh, adding to that, I would also talk about Celeste, Limbo, Insight, uh, and uh, her story, all of these are amazing games. There's also a really short game on Steam, which is free called Missing. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Missed Messages, my bad. Uh, Missed Messages is a really, really small game, but it actually talks about, uh, I think you should play it because it's about what the consequences of you just missing a message from a friend. And I think people should play it. It's free. Uh, I don't want to give out any spoilers because you should experience it. That's great. Thank you for that. I'll definitely be checking that out after this. Um, Craig, would you would you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Just quickly, I, I would say not to shy away from any sensitive or you know um, kind of sketchy topics. Almost just just be open with them and just make whatever you want to make. Because if you look out there, like if you look at that dragon cancer, for example, this war of mine, stuff like that, they're dealing with very sensitive issues and they're still going out there and getting a degree of mainstream success. So there's no barrier there that you shouldn't be shying away from, from sensitive topics. Just educate yourself on them, make sure you understand them and, and, and just make these things. Because I think the more that happens, the more it's going to expand. You're going to see more and more gamers, particularly in the mainstream, you're going to start seeing more of these games, more sensitive topics covered, more inclusion, more representation. It can only be good for the industry, I think. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, would any of our panelists like to share a message or a resource for young game makers, young aspiring game makers? Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my message goes to uh, my fellow Africans, especially here in Uganda. You might have ideas and you out there and you, you you're scared to come out uh, this industry just requires ideas and together then we can work together to have something out you might not come out to do the whole game yourself but you might have a very 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 brilliant idea 
just bring it out. We have uh, the, the people around uh, that can help you have the, the idea realized. It can get us uh, forward because in Uganda, we are still at a low, but we believe we can also get to, to, to that level, uh, especially as the government tries to uh, make sure that uh, uh, that schools access computers are provided, the infrastructure is developed. Uh, first of all, uh, they cannot develop this infrastructure if there's no demand. If we create the demand and say we've created all these and we don't have electricity here in this school, it's uh, incumbent upon them Sure that the electricity is there, give them, them to make sure there are computers in that school. So let's not sit on these uh, ideas and talents, bring them out and work together, and we make the industry also thrive in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure that was very inspiring for young Ugandans. Elisa, go ahead. Um, just a quick reference, Games for Change website has uh, many, 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 many different games. So you can put in the searcher anything and then you can find many pro-social games. And uh, one recommendation would be playing in global game jams uh, with other jams. Uh, jams are like the, the best way to start um, practicing. And the other is uh, trying to get a problem solved with a game. Um, finding a problem and trying to solve it with a game and, and then you have a client and then you have someone that will use it. No, That would be my recommendation. That, that is so interesting. I think that's a very, very useful tip for everybody in the audience to check out. And although I also have so many questions and so does our audience, that's all the time that we have today. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us, for taking the time to do this. And thank you to our audience for asking so many pertinent questions. If you wish to reach out to any of the panelists and if your questions remain unanswered, their details will be up on the Play Talk Change website and you feel, please feel free to write to them. We now hand over back to Mehek, our chair for the day. Thank you for that wonderful, such a colorful conversation with such diverse perspectives. We have heard from people across the world. We have heard from people who are in different stages and areas of work. And we now not only see just a light at the end of the tunnel to making social impact with games, but we see a whole bridge to doing that. And definitely one can say that games can bring change. <laughs>